Hey everybody, this is Robot here from ScooterWest.com, Vespa Motorsport here in San Diego. It's a week later and this is part two of the complete overhaul of the Vespa GTS engine. And as I suggested in part one, this, you know, all the instructions here kind of apply to the full range of uh, Piaggio and Vespa automatic engines. They're all very similar architecture. So say you're rebuilding an LX or an ET4 150, a Piaggio Beverly 250, any of those motors are very, very similar. They just have some minor differences. Sometimes that minor difference is just it's air-cooled in two valves versus four valves. Uh, another minor difference between a GT200 is the electric start uh, system's a little bit different, laid out different. They have different configurations for the transmissions. Um, some of the other internal parts are a little different, but how they go together is pretty much the same across the board. Um, we had two bikes out. Uh, this brown one was severely overheated and the blue scooter that's on the lift here uh, needed a complete crankshaft and I pointed that out when we pulled the top end and tore down the complete bottom end. Um, finished the brown bike, sorry I couldn't videotape every part of it, but pretty much everything I'm doing on the, the blue bike is a complete overhaul so it's just very much similar. The parts I'm left over with are the warp cylinder head, I end up replacing the thermostat cover, the thermostat, and because it was severely overheated, also the thermistor for the engine temperature, that connector is completely loose because it melted part of the plastic. And again, I point out it melted the plastic clip that holds the, the spark plug boot in case in place. Uh, I, I did a pressure check or filled each, each of the valve pockets or intake and exhaust pockets with water water leaks right through the head. Um, it is possible to salvage this head. You could send it off to get machined, you know, replaned. Um, all the valve seats would need to be cut. I would also suggest putting new valves, but I don't want to take any chances. Um, I've gone through those kind of efforts in the past and I've had um, engines that have an internal crack in the head. Uh, with a small head like this, it's pretty hard to determine if there's a crack in it sometimes not worth salvaging, especially since I know this engine was severely overheated. Uh, on the cylinder, I mean, it's still built a little bit of compression, but the piston and cylinder walls are pretty scored up, so a complete top end. And the last part I didn't show, and it caught me, was the water pump. Well, pretty much put the engine together, put some water in it, and it immediately started leaking out of the, um, the water pump. And I should know better. I've had a lot of these motors apart, have overheated or I kind of know, you know, what, what to expect, you know, based on the, um, you know, what's happened to the motor a lot of times. And oftentimes if the motors run completely out of coolant, it will pretty much melt down the uh, water pump seal. So I went back in there, pretty simple job just to change out the water pump seal. Went ahead and did that, had one more um, little cooling system related issue. Have the whole motor back together, scooter rides great, test road 5-10 miles, come back. Uh, the system's all bled the coolant and I'm running it or idling it for about 10 minutes and I noticed, oh, the high temp light is on. Not high, high enough temp to release pressure from the radiator cap. Uh, hook up the diagnostic tool and realize, that, well, the fan's activated but it's not running. So I did a little further diagnostics on the scooter, checked the fan relay and I found out the fan motor was also uh, um, defective or sometimes the fans are never used. So, you know, no one ever gets them up to the temperature where the fan will come on. I've seen blown fuses, other problems that relate to the cooling fan. Only time you know if the cooling fan is not working is um, after prolonged idle, which was one of the tests I did. So I went in ahead, replaced the cooling fan, test rode for a couple miles, allowed the scooter to idle for 15, 20 minutes, no leaks cooling fan cycles on and off, which is normal operation. And this scooter's all good to go. Here we got the table of all the motor parts from that motor we disassembled. Everything's been cleaned. I've inspected all the parts. I've done some measurements to check, check clearances. Um, just going through everything. Since I'm doing a complete 
engine overhaul on this uh, blue GTS that was starved of engine oil. Um, you can see I have it all organized in different parts of the engine and I'll go over that. Uh, I know this video might get lengthy for somebody who's experienced with tearing down uh, engines in general, but I kind of want to cover all my bases. A lot of people like just to see you know, every single little part of you know, whatever the operations. If it's boring, just skip past the video or to where you need to see. You know, this is YouTube. This isn't uh, the 1980s with a VHS tape. Um, but let me jump into all the parts of the motor, kind of how they're organized on this table here. So I'll start with the core of the engine, which is the engine cases, or sometimes referred to as the bottom end. Bottom end contains the crankshaft. Here's the crankshaft. You can see the rod does not move, so that crankshaft's going to get replaced. Um, pretty much all these parts right here consist of the bottom end. And in the engine cases, you have two sides of the engine cases. This uh, engine case splits um, vertically. I mean, some motorcycles, they'll split horizontally, you know, much like sport bikes, just the architecture of the motor. But most scooter motors, they're single cylinders, split vertically. So the crank, crankshaft resides within this cavity. You can see the plain main bearings, which are very accurately sized to the um, journals on the crankshaft. And I'll talk about that when we get to fitting the new crankshaft. A couple other parts that are inside the engine case. You have this little plug and that's a little socket that this oil screen fits into. So before you put the engine case together, that needs to be fitted with an O-ring. You got the oil screen that kind of catches the big chunks and small particles of gaskets. Um, you know, other parts that go around the engine, sometimes you have uh, flakes from the, um, the, the casting, the aluminum casting process itself. This will catch it before it goes through the oil filter. Uh, not pictured here is an oil filter. This is your drain cap. There's 10 M6 by 60 bolts that hold the uh, left and right engine cases together. This is your oil pressure switch. That indicates if you have low oil pressure. Uh, sometimes I see these fail by leaking oil from the terminal or they'll flicker even though you have oil pressure. Um, you also use this port for checking oil pressure when verifying a problem with an engine. As uh, so what I found, you know, if the engines are noisy, they have low oil pressure, you don't really need to check it. I mean, the motor's coming apart and that's just what you gotta do. You got the dipstick for the engine oil, gearbox oil. And if you're wondering what this little thing is, this is a, a bushing that the center stand uh, you know, pretty much spins on through the case since the center stand is attached to the engine cases. So you got the springs, the bushing, bolt, nut, and there's some O-rings, and over to your left here is the center stand itself. So that pretty much consists of all the parts for the, um, the bottom end. Here we got all the parts to the left engine cover, and is what's in the left engine cover is you got the oil pump, you got the timing chain, you have the oil pan itself that, that covers up some of the parts of the timing system and also holds extra oil, has the filler. We also have the guide, one of the guides for the timing chain. Not shown here is the main seal. Uh, the last part that's underneath this cover is the oil pressure relief piston. So between the spring and the piston, that's what regulates the, uh, the oil pressure of these engines. Here we got all the parts of the right engine cover and I'll go over th everything. Here's the, the cover itself. There's a, a mechanical seal for your water pump. And if I flip this over, you'll see the water pump impeller. Uh, this scooter's got very low miles and was not run out of coolant, so I'm not going to overhaul the water pump. I'm going to do a separate video on removal of this cover and overhauling the water pump. You don't necessarily need to replace this whole entire part to do the water pump. The water pump can be overhauled. Uh, with a couple special tools, or I have all the tools here, 
we have quite a few customers send um, water pumps to us to get overhauled. This is the, I don't know, I call it the little snail. It's the cover with some of the hoses, a bypass hose and the cooling hoses that goes over the water pump. You have the stator plate and that's what generates electricity. There's also a pickup coil which times the engine. You know, Sinkwitz is the uh, ignition spark, fuel injection, and other activities are electronically controlled that are um, timed to the engine rotation. Here we got the flywheel, which has very strong magnets that energize the stator, and there's 24 teeth on the outside, and the ECU or the computer inside the scooter uses those teeth to determine the exact timing position while the engine's running. You see this large gear here? You can see it only turns one direction. In there is a sprag, sprag clutch. I left it all together because sometimes they'll fall apart if you separate this gear from the, um, the flywheel. Uh, so what that is a one-way clutch that allows the electric start motor, which is up here, to turn over the engine. But once the engine started, uh, it freewheels and no longer is engaged with electric start. This is the intermediate gear for the electric start system. And we also have the associated hardware, a Woodruff key, one dowel, the two other dowels are still in the engine case, a timing inspection cap. We got nine M6 by 35 uh, bolts that hold the case on and one extra long M6 by 112 millimeter bolt. Here we got the top end of the engine. If there's one part that's the heart of the whole entire engine, it's the top end. It's what creates the power, it's where the internal combustion happens. Um, I don't know. You need all the other parts for the engine, but this is the part that most people talk about changing over when you're doing performance upgrades. Um, it's a part that can be separated from the bottom end without tearing down the left and right crankcase covers and the bottom end. Um, I'll go over all the parts starting with the cylinder. You have the cylinder itself. Uh, there isn't oversized pistons for these. There's categories of pistons that are matched to the cylinder. This engine had no issues running. It just was starved of oil and damaged the crankshaft. Uh, the piston, I checked the specifications of it, measured it out. There's some very minor scoring. That's pretty normal. Uh, the rings look very clean. I kind of run my nail over all the rings. The ring and gaps are good. I'm going to reuse the piston and piston rings as this motor has very low miles. If you're dealing with a higher miles motor, it may be a good idea just to replace that group of parts um, as that's the most critical part that builds the compression for the motor. Uh, the ne next major part of the engine is the cylinder head. In here, the cam rides on these plain bearings. They're very clean. Even though the engine was starved of oil, I've found that the cam has such low load that it doesn't necessarily damage the um, journals for the, the camshaft. You got the valves, valve springs. You can see some, I think my LX150 cylinder kit video shows how to take a cylinder head all the way apart. And I clean most of the surfaces adequate for reassembly, except for that little mark. I check the, uh, both the intake and exhaust valves without the cam in there, fill these both with water. No leakage from each of the valves, spark plug will get replaced. Um, no issues, this motor wasn't overheated. I wouldn't suspect that it has a warped surface. I just cleaned this one more time prior to assembly with a, um, a solvent to get all the last little bit of grease marks off it. Kind of pretty critical, you know, when you're reassembling. I left the, um, the coolant temperature sensor on this. You want to take care when you're cleaning all these parts not to get water into that connection. I found it ends up uh, causing erroneous uh, readings and the cooling fan ends up coming on prematurely. Uh, you have the valve cover here, the associated bolts. This is your thermostat cover. If the engine's been overheated, oftentimes you got to replace it, as I showed you. There's the thermostat itself. I find them to be quite reliable. Unfortunately, you can't get the rubber seal. That's part of the thermostat as a separate part. Because what I've found is you seal this with a small amount of uh, silicon sealant, high temp silicon sealant, and it will hold just fine with the original thermostat. Um, if you suspect any issues, there is a test where you can put in boiling water and watch it open. You have the cam chain tensioner. It's been reset, and I'll show when I'm assembling that. You have two or more of those uh, M6 
by 112 millimeter long bolts and they go down the, um, the cam chain tunnel to tighten down the cylinder head. All these little parts right here are the automatic decompression system. It allows the engine to turn over freely when you're cranking the motor over to start. It allows Piaggio to use a much smaller electric start motor for a single cylinder piston. Uh, you got your timing sprocket, a plate, uh, this is like a thrust plate for the camshaft that holds the camshaft in place. You got the cylinder head nuts. Uh, last thing on the, the engine cases, they do have cylinder studs. Uh, the cylinder studs are identical to the ones used in the BB350. Is what I've read is Piaggio specifies replacement if you're um, doing an overhaul of a BB350 or Beverly 350. But on any of the smaller motors, they do not sus um, specify replacement. Uh, if I find any rust on them or any, any issues with them, I will replace them. Or if the cylinder head came loose and it, it blew a head gasket, for instance, I would just replace them to be on the safe side. Uh, pretty inexpensive, but I've never seen issues with a normal motor that I've had to take them apart you know, and replace them on anything under 300 cc's. You have two rockers. They're two different uh, shapes. They look nearly identical but you could see that the, uh, the fingers on them are in different spots. Those are adjusters. This is your exhaust rocker and it's got some galling. I'm gonna go ahead and replace that. The intake rocker is still in good shape. Here's your camshaft. And again, when we tore it apart, you could see there's some galling on the exhaust lobe of the hard face of the lobe. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace that. Here we got the transmission components of the engine. Uh, the crankshaft is tied to the variator and pretty much transmits the torque all through all, or through all these components. Uh, this is your case that resides the final drive gearbox and all the parts above that line are part of the final drive. It's lubricated by uh, 80, 90 gearbox oil, a small amount of it. There's three gear shafts in there. There's seven fasteners total that hold this cover. There's one trick fastener that's slightly shorter than the six main fasteners that hold this cover in place. And there's also a vent tube that's put right in that groove. Uh, behind this gear is uh, oil seal. Um, if you had to replace, if you're leaking oil out of the hub, you'd pull this whole gearbox apart, which can be done with the engine inside the scooter, you know, with the wheel removed, much like you're doing a tire change, take the brakes off, and you could pull this cover off to gain access to this. You got an oil seal that's on this shaft here, and there's also oil seal and bearing that's reside in this shaft. Uh, one thing with these gearboxes, say if you have a bearing that fails or you have a, a tooth that's chipped, maybe because the gearbox oil has never changed. I found anytime this gearbox has been contaminated with metal particles from either a failed bearing or failed gear, you have to replace all the parts. So that includes all the bearings need to be pulled out. All the bearings need to be pulled out of the, um, the engine case itself. That's the rest of the bearings that support these gear shafts. Um, you know, not worth taking any risk as the gears cost quite a bit of money. Bearings aren't that expensive. Maybe if you caught it early where it's just starting to make noise, you can just replace the bearings and you'd be okay. Uh, again, with this motor, there was no need to take this apart. The complete gasket kit that I'm going to use includes a new gasket, so I thought I'd split the gear case just to show you the parts in there. Um, if I was just changing a crankshaft, not really any reason to take this apart, but it's a good idea if you have the gasket, you can go in there, clean out any medical, or small metal particles that you'd find in the oil, because you're a good, good opportunity. Also, the gasket kit does include the oil seals for those shafts if you want to change those out. Uh, here's your transmission itself which consists of your variator. This is your fixed half uh, drive pulley. This is your movable half drive pulley, commonly referred to as a variator. All the rollers reside in this. And these are rollers. Um, these are specific rollers. They kind of color them this orangish red color for the 300. If it's a 250, they're um, green on the 200 cc motors. They're gonna be blue. The BB 250s have a, uh, they end up using the 300 ones. I'm not sure why they change it. It's just how they do it. Here's the clutch. This is the clutch bell itself. Belt, uh, clutch drive. It's a perfect opportunity to change out the belt. 
Rollers are in perfect shape. I'm going to reuse that. I cleaned all these parts. Customer opts to do a belt just to um, start fresh since it's a consumable part. So I'm going to throw the belt away, put a new belt. I don't really need to go into this much because there's uh, quite a few videos I have of servicing the um, variator, transmission, belt, all that kind of stuff. So anytime you tear a motor apart, you're going to need to replace, at the very minimum, the gaskets and seals that hold the, um, the fluids inside the motor and hold it all together. Uh, many of them aren't reusable. They get torn as you tear them apart. They're just not designed to be reused. Uh, Piaggio offers the gasket kits in two different variations. Uh, the complete gasket part number is 497462. Um, it's kind of complete gasket in quotes because it doesn't quite include everything. And same goes with a top end gasket. Say you just need to tear the top end apart, part number on that is 497545. And that would only be the top end gaskets, like a head gasket, base gasket, and all the other little gaskets. Unfortunately, they don't quite, they're not as complete as Piaggio likes to market them as. Um, anytime the bottom ends apart, you end up changing out this main seal here. Part number on this is A28875. This is going to be the most difficult part for a do-it-yourself uh, mechanic to change. As in, here, let me open the present here to show you the part. So there's the main seal right there. It's, it's a very specifically designed seal for these uh, Piaggio engines. And there's a very specific tool for installing them. Uh, it is possible to install it without I've never bothered doing it that way because I've always had the special tools, but I've heard of people changing them very carefully with a punch, a lot of grease, and, and a careful eye. Some of the other parts you're going to need when you assemble the bottom end is this is a copper gasket for the oil sensor. For some reason, it's not included. I think it's 485075. And with the top end and bottom end gaskets, they never include the valve cover uh, sealing washers. Part number on those is A30249, you'll need five of those. Uh, when you attach the muffler to the header, you're gonna need the graphite bushing. So any, any home mechanic that's done tire changes and their own work on a GTS and has for quite a few miles has at some point replaced this. Uh, we use the older part number here, 846097, even though we do ship the newer part number. The newer part kind of has that um, kind of steel wool appearance on the one side, while the older one kind of has a, a graphite on both sides. Part number again on that, 846097. You're going to need an oil filter, A2635-PA. That's the spin on oil filter. Uh, overlooked part is at the thermostat, there's a very small O-ring. In 2011, I think it was, 2010, they went to a larger size O-ring because sometimes they leak. Unfortunately, it's not included in any of the uh, gasket kits, 878-906. Uh, the head gasket that's included in the kit uh, is only the 250 one. I have had some kits that have included both, but sometimes they just ship them with the 250 gasket alone. Not sure why, but need to include the uh, the head gasket for the 300, specific to the 300, A48168. Base gaskets are consistent uh, pretty much from 125 all the way to 300, with exception to the Primavera and Sprint. Any of the new three valve motors have a, a different design base gasket. I'm going to replace the spark plug just because, kind of change it out anytime you tear, tear the motor apart. Uh, some of the other incidental parts you're going to need to finish the install is hose clamps that reattach to coolant and the uh, crankcase breather hose. These are the very nice quality German hose clamps, uh, HCL 12 soft. It replaces the clamp style hose clamp. I'm not going to reuse those style. I'll, you know, in the first video, I cut them all out of, out of place. The latest 2018s, they actually started going to that style hose clamp because they've had problems with them. Uh, for the smaller hoses, you'll need HCL6 Mini. Again, we do have those available if you want to use the OEM uh, stepless style clamps. They're kind of difficult to use. You need to size them. Not really worth messing with, in my opinion, unless you want the scooter to look just 100% original. Another uh, thing you're going to need anytime you remove the piston, 
is the sir clip. Uh, different sizes for the different engines. Uh, 875096 is the 16 millimeter size for the um, the 300 piston pin. Uh, another thing that's always uh, nice to have extra is oftentimes these will be rusted into the cylinder head or you'll lose them. It's like the easiest part to lose. It's the dowels and they're used throughout the motor for the left and right engine cases, the center engine case, uh, also between the cylinder and the cylinder deck surface. Uh, used in a couple different areas. There's a couple other dowels, but they're larger. This is the dowel that's most easily damaged. It's a good idea just to have those on hand. Uh, Piaggio uses uh, quite a few zip ties or tie wraps, so you want to have those on hand. As I suggested, the customer is going to go ahead and replace the drive belt. And we're going to replace uh, these three components that have been damaged by the, um, the oil starvation. I have one more part, but I don't have it out here. I'm going to replace the oil pump as well, just to be on the safe side. You know, the oil pump, you know, it's ingested some metal from the motor, motor running low. Not worth uh, reusing the old one. It's very inexpensive. Uh, the oil pump does come apart, but, you know, it's not, not needed. There's two different categories of the crank. They call one, uh, there's a category one and a category two. You want to match it to the existing crankshaft that's in the scooter. This is a category two crankshaft. Uh, we have the rocker and the camshaft that's also going to get replaced. So during disassembly, I use this tool that installs and removes the main seal. Uh, this is a dual purpose tool. It's the factory tool. Again, there is ways around not using it. I'm going to use it because it it's the most accurate way to install the main seal. Uh, when I go ahead and install the main seal, I kind of give you some pointers on how to do it by hand, you know, with just a basic punch and carefully install it, you know, in installing it. Uh, but that's, if you're going to do more than one engine or your shop, this is definitely the tool to have, most important tool when you're assembling the engine. Another Piaggio tool that's definitely not necessary, this is a, a flywheel holder. Allows you to easily torque the, um, the flywheel. Unfortunately on the 300s, uh, they change it to a three prong pin, so Piaggio just recommends removing one of these pins. But I've found with like a strap wrench, which is a common uh, tool that can be easily attained, it works just as well as using this. So not necessarily needed for reassembly of the engine. Uh, anytime you put together engine parts such as the cam, shaft rockers, all that will need assembly lube. You want to have an oiler, you know, for oiling everything, kind of give it its pre-lubrication before it um, start up, kind of get everything oiled as you assemble it. You don't want to assemble anything that's oiled dry. Uh, not necessarily needed because they don't really use it, well, maybe with the pickup coil, but uh, you'll need some sort of blue thread locker. You know, there's a Loctite brand, this is whatever worth brand, but the blue medium strength thread lockers, uh, nice to have. Don't want to go crazy with that. I've taken apart engines where somebody thought it was a good idea to put on every single fastener, and all it does is makes the job much more difficult. The engineers figured out the screws aren't going to fall out on these engines, and they rarely do, so why do you need to use thread locker for their torque to the correct spec? No, not really needed. So to do a job of this caliper, uh, you just need, you know, kind of a comprehensive mechanic set. So here I got quarter inch drive socket set. I have Torx, Allens, got some longer Allens to make the job a little easier sometimes. I got a uh, full rack of uh, 3 8 drive sockets. Uh, this is pretty nice since a lot of the fasteners are small. It's a T-handle. I put an 8 millimeter um, socket on there. Nice easy way to get a good feel for um, installing a lot of fasteners rapidly without using power tools. You're going to need some torque wrenches. This one goes up to um, 100 foot pounds, which is adequate for everything on these engines. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be a digital one. And just, you know, the, the general tool set. I mean, there's going to be some other tools I pulled out. I'll pull out as I assemble the motor. Uh, needle nose, screwdrivers. Uh, when you put the transmission together, you'll see in the variator um, and belt service videos I've done, 
there's two specific tools you need to hold those, um, the clutch and the variator. So you'll need those as well. So number one, you gotta put the crankshaft in the crankcase and close up the crankcase. Uh, cleaned all these parts in the parts washer. You can still see that there's just a little bit of uh, gasket residue left. And I find like a fresh razor blade just car carves the last of the, the gaskets off just fine. You don't wanna leave any of that residue. You can see I left a little bit behind there. I'll use some compressed air and blow the, blow the last little bit of residue out. It's not gonna be the end of the world. But try not to scrape the aluminum too much. Again, a uh, straight edge razor works good. There's specific gasket scrapers that I usually use in the parts washer that just look like a chisel, essentially. And those, those kind of help make the job a little easier. So I have all the parts ready to go for my uh, crankshaft installation. Opened up the main gasket kit. You're gonna need the crankcase uh, main gasket. There's gonna be these two O-rings that are, I don't know, around 25 millimeters an inch diameter. There's one that's a little bit smaller than the other. That's for the oil drain plug. And this one's for your, um, for that oil uh, cover. So uh, you'll need both of those. For the center stand, there's gonna be two O-rings. And again, if you're doing this for the first time, you may save all the old gaskets, just so you have a reference. But pretty much all these parts are what's needed to start putting the bottom end together here. All right, so first thing that needs to go in is this little plug. Uh, as I suggested, you're gonna need this smaller O-ring. Sorry, I'm in the way. So wrap the O-ring around there, goes right in that groove. You wanna have assembly lube handy. Just a small amount on some of these uh, O-rings, just enough to keep the uh, O-ring from getting torn. And I'll be wiping that part back up since I fumbled and dropped it out of my hands. You don't want any of the dirt that's on the ground. But I'm not perfect, I drop stuff. I try not to drop old scooters, but that hasn't happened in a while, so that's good. So, okay, cleaned again, drop it back in. You can see it only goes in one direction. That's dropped in. Uh, while we have the assembly lube out, we're gonna lubricate the thrust bearing surface on the case. And as I suggest, they have a small amount of galling, but they're still safe to use, no issue there. We're gonna take the crankshaft, and I've already inspected it for any uh, marks or galling on it. You know, just sometimes there's little burrs, or not galling, but burrs from when they machine it. Make sure none of that stuff's on there. There's a number two there that indicates it's a number two. Sometimes it's engra engraved on the end of the crank as the crank we pulled out was engraved there. Number two there. And sometimes they hand write it. You can just barely see it on the case, but they'll hand write number two on there. So you take the longer shaft, that goes into the larger size of the side of the case. Make sure it turns freely, kind of every step kind of you want to verify, make sure there's no issues. Put a small amount of uh, assembly lube on this side. On some uh, models, there's a dowel that goes in here. It looks like a dowel goes in here. Uh, this, this one, there isn't a dowel. There's only the two dowels that are pressed into the case. They're not gonna remove easily, so I left them alone. Go ahead and drop the gasket up on. Keep in mind, there is some variations of these gaskets on different models that it's very subtle variations where the shape has changed. So kind of double check, make sure you're putting the right gasket on versus just throwing it on there willy-nilly. I'll take the case, everything's cleaned out in here, and again, assembly lube on the plane bearings on your, uh, what's that, your left side engine case. So you see it's got this bridge right there. This is no big deal, but we'll go ahead and drop this on. One other thing I'll show you, there's a plate in there. I didn't bother removing that, but if that's not there, you're probably gonna have some, some sort of issue with the engine. Engineers put it there for a reason. Um, you wanna take, I think it's 10 of these bolts, the 60 millimeter screws, and just drop them all in place.
And the final torque for all these is about seven and a half foot pounds. What is that, 10 Newton meters, something like that. And I'm, oh, there it is. So all the bolts dropped in. You know, sometimes when you clean parts, the whole idea when you do them by hand, you could feel if they hit anything. If there's some debris inside the hole, you'd feel that. And I'm going kind of crisscross. So I'm just, just make, you know, seating all the fasteners. You saw I didn't put anything on the gasket. No need to do that with these uh, modern gaskets. You don't need to put any silicone or any, anything on them. Silicone would, would definitely not be a good idea for a in, you know, modern engine like this. It has a lot of oil passages, small jets that could get clogged with a uh, silicon sealant. And yes, I have taken apart motors where they've been siliconed all back together. It's not pretty sight sometimes. And all of them are going in freely. They've all bottomed out onto the case, which is good. There are 10 Newton meters, there we go. So you know, when, when you have uh, something like that, it kind of throws you off a little bit on what you're doing. So you sometimes got to go back. You know, I just double check that fastener. It's already right there at 10 Newton meters. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I got that one. That one I did not get. And with low fasteners, I mean, a lot of times you don't want to go back over them, but you could verify them all. So 10, with the low torques, it's, it's, you're not turning the fastener any further. So yeah, you just give yourself the verification that you tighten it. Cause it would be kind of a disaster if you didn't tighten one or two of these, you'd end up with like a case that leaks and kind of wondering what's going on. And we're good, so. And I won't mess with that other torque wrench again. It was bugging me. So I tore that little piece of paper out. Make sure the uh, crankshaft turns freely. Turns very nice in there. No issues, doesn't bind up, doesn't do anything weird. And I'll show you the last thing that you wanna do with this gasket before we take it out or put some more parts. So, is what you need to do is cut that little piece of gasket in there. Be careful it doesn't fall in. It went flying over to the, the side. If, if you're not confident about, you know, you don't want to let anything fall in there, you could always shove a rag inside the, the crankcase hole. And I didn't really point out, but I set this on two uh, wooden blocks because the shaft of the crankshaft sticks beyond the machine surface of the uh, the right side crankcase or the left side crankcase there. So I'm gonna wipe off the excess uh, grease. A lot of times these tapers, you don't wanna have grease on them or oil on them when you put a, a crankshaft on there. Uh, a couple other parts go in there. Uh, if that O-ring looks bad, you could replace it. I cleaned all the metal and debris out of this. There's no tears in it. So that can go right in there. The second O-ring is the one for your oil drain. You can use assembly lube, something to, you know, any type of grease, pretty much. Put a little bit more than I need to. Hold the O-ring in place. And I find these oil drains, including by my own tech sometimes, way over tightened. I think it's like, oh, I haven't looked it up in a long time, but it's only like 20 foot pounds, it's not much. So just, you know, even that was enough, where the O-ring just seated, and that was probably like two foot pounds, and it would not come loose, but just a little bit. I didn't use a big torque wrench or any type of breaker bar. The oil filter, there's some debate on if you should fill them up or not fill them up. Um, sometimes filling them up, there's the, the small chance of uh, debris that you're pouring into the uh, filtered side of the oil filter. Grease up the O-ring, that's adequate. Um, I'm just gonna put it on dry because everything's gonna have a coat of either assembly lube or um, oil on it. You know, so for the first startup, we're gonna monitor and make sure the uh, oil pressure builds up. So just to show you the oil filter, it's like pretty much I had it hand tight where the O-ring seats. 
and you can just go, I mean, there is a torque on it. I think it's like seven foot pounds. You can go with the, the slotted tool. There is other variations of the oil filter. They're pretty much almost as tight as you could do it just with your fist on it. You don't want to like really crank on it. You don't want to put a wrench on it, but there's no way that's coming off. So that's perfectly adequate for the, the um, oil filter there. So this is your uh, shaft at the, um, the center stand pivots on. You want to take a waterproof grease, much like this Maxima grease, I should have showed that. Uh, the assembly lube is a little bit too thin of grease, you know, it wouldn't be ideal for something like this. But you know, smear this, fill the little grooves with grease. And I find a lot of times I'll push a scooter off to the center stand, I can just tell it has a, this is completely dried out and there's no grease on it. And it kind of is, bugs me a little bit, you know, when you're, it makes the scooter feel so much nicer when everything moves freely. Take your two O-rings here. You might have to display some of the grease. But the shaft, this is what seals the, uh, the road dirt and water out, out from the, um, the center stand pivot. So those O-rings are included with the whole kit. You know, any of these gaskets that are in the, you know, if you want to do just service the center stand, you just buy those um, gaskets separate. So we're going to slide the center stand on. Make sure you don't tear the O-ring. See how the O-ring kind of wants to slip a little bit? You know, they put plenty of grease on it, so it's not going to... And if it's being stubborn, you can use a pick or a needle nose or something just to kind of hold the, uh, the O-ring down. So when this slides over it, there we go. Take the pivot bolt. It goes this direction. You have two springs here, and you can see that there's like a little bit longer loop on one side and a shorter loop. Put a little bit of grease on the ends there. And the problem is the motor doesn't have much mass, so, you know, trying to pull something that has a lot of tension, you know, it's a little difficult. And you want to do one spring at a time, so I'm going to start with a shallow one. You know, be careful that you don't get yourself in the face with the spring. So there's one spring. And then the little spring. Get in there and hook the other spring. And I don't know, if you're really strong, you could do both at one time. Of course, it's way easier when the, uh, the, the scooter, you know, the motor's attached to the scooter. See how I'm fighting? fighting with a motor and only doing this with one hand. Yeah, or you can even use your, the rest of your body to kind of, the. Almost there. There we go. Now the springs are both attached. So make sure both hooked. Again, wear eye protection. Those th when those springs go flying, they're, um, quite lethal. And of course it was kind of barbaric techniques of installing it there, kind of putting my body up against the motor. And since it's a nylock nut, you, you're going to have to hold the other side. You could just do it with a regular, another socket, an open end wrench. Let's grab the easiest tool I could grab from the. And I'll show you why I like having to stand on the, uh, the motor early on. So not too critical. It's probably like 25 or 30 foot pounds, not a critical torque. Nice thing about having the stand is it's, flip the motor over. And once you get the rear end built with the wheel on it, the engine essentially has its own stand. So it's kind of sits up there. It's a little easier to work on. You know, you could leave it in place and also, you know, set the, uh, the engine back on the wood blocks. You know, much like I was working on earlier. 
So just kind of personal preference. There's not necessarily an engine stand because the engine stand is built into the engine here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and put together part of the, um, the right hand cover. I'm going to put the flywheel on. Reason being is it's a good way to turn the engine over. You could technically put the left side together first, but just, just the way I like doing it. Not really any preference. All right, so I have my flywheel with the one-way sprag and ring gear. Got the, uh, the intermediate gear, my starter motor. I got the wood of key, very important. Uh, the two screws that hold the starter. There's a clip that retains the, um, the ring gear in place. And I'm gonna go ahead and put just those components on. I'm not gonna put the water pump cover on just yet. Um, I'll just show you how this comes apart. See how you can't, you gotta turn it clockwise as you pull it out very carefully. And these little rollers are spring-loaded. Uh, this is a later style Sprag. Some of the earlier ones have a whole bunch of little like paws or whatever they call them, I don't know, something like that. They have like, I don't know, like a dozen or maybe two dozen of them in there. Uh, the later style went to these just three rollers and they have these pins that hold them in place. And you gotta be careful because they will pop out. If you're washing this part, all those, the little springs and all the little rollers, all that stuff fall out. Uh, doesn't really need, you know, it's got a thin film of oil already on it. And again, to put it together, you just kind of turn it clockwise as you're s slowly dropping it in. And just leave it like that. It's best not to really mess with it. Not, not really any need to do so. All right, so with the connecting rod almost pulled all the way out, it puts the, the keyway a little past 12 o'clock, like in between 12 and one o'clock or something like that. Uh, the keyway, a lot of times it's, it's, it's kind of a tight fit, especially if it's a new crank. Um, you just want to try pressing it in. I don't want to use a hammer to, to drive it in there, but you need to drive it where it, it seats at the bottom of the keyway. And it also follows the, uh, the angle of the um, taper. So you can see the keyway is in place. Um, this is kind of tricky. Um, you got to drop both this gear and this down at the same time. If you try to put this, then this is in the way and so on. So I'm going to have these both ready to go. Get a little assembly lube on a couple parts of it. Very small amount on this uh, bronze bushing in here. And that's a lower part. I'm not going to, I don't want to get any on the taper. Um, both, both shafts of the, um, the skier. This is your initial lubrication. And if you look down, you can see the wood of key slot, the, the keyway essentially. So I'm gonna hold this in my one hand and, and I'm gonna start to get this drop down. So I'm kind of starting to drop it down. It's going onto the, the keyway. So I put, pop that intermediate gear in there, get my hands out of the way. And you can see it's all in place. And you can see when I turn the motor counterclockwise, the gear turns. When the motor's in normal running clockwise direction, then the gear is stationary. There's this little tang that holds the, um, the, the starter ring gear in place. They never use Loctite on it. If you feel insecure about it, you, you know, this would be a spot that you can, can put some Loctite on. Be careful, there is an opening in the, um, the case that could allow the screwdriver and that little tang to drop down. I'm using a number two screwdriver, screwdriver on it. You technically want to use a number three if you want to get the maximum torque on the thing to tighten it. So just hand tight with a number three screwdriver. And that's all you need to do for that little guy there. All right, so you got the flat washer, drops on the crank. Don't need to put any Loctite of any sort on this. And I'm just gonna spin that on there. And we're gonna need a, a large 24 millimeter socket and a torque wrench that's like way up there, like about 90 foot pounds, I think is torque due, right around 90 foot pounds. This is pretty much just tighten it tight. If there's any technical term. I'll show how the factory tool works. So this little collar threads on. And the way it works is this drops in and it will find a, um, 
Again, this is a newer style flywheel that has the um, three pins. So that one single pin kind of engages, the other pin doesn't. So here's a strap wrench. And there's two types of strap wrenches. You could use a one that's like a chain and you get this around the whole thing and have your helper hold this as you're torquing the center nut to about 90 foot pounds. You can also use a chain wrench, which looks similar, but has a strap that's made of chain links, essentially. That's another way to do it. Um, center stand gives me a little bit of leverage here to torque this thing. But you can see that, you know, since this is a newer style flywheel, it kind of wants to slip, so. So since I didn't want to mess with my uh, factory tool, I just used the chain wrench. I dropped a, a, a bolt, you know, the pivot bolt right through this. This is a very strong point of the engine. And it's a good way to lock up the motor because, you know, trying to torque this thing to 90 foot pounds is, um, you know, it's quite a bit of force. And I'm gonna get on this side. You see the chain wrench is locked up. Another thing you could do is, you know, flip the motor over. Oops, I know you can't really see what I'm doing, but, you know, it's basically, I'm, I'm working against the, the table now, so you can get a full 90 foot pounds on it. There we go. So bolt can come out. And again, with the factory tool, this is the factory holder that holds it up against the case. If you remove this pin, it would engage into one of these pins just fine and work just as well. But, you know, sometimes you gotta improvise, especially the home mechanic. You know, you're not gonna have this tool. A chain wrench is a lot easier to obtain. You know, it's not something you're gonna buy at a local hardware store, but um, pretty easy to find otherwise, so. The whole, the whole idea of why this is tight is now I can easily turn the motor over and set it, you know, as I'm turning things over to um, adjust. So to install the starter, O-ring isn't included with the gasket kit, but I rarely ever find problems with these O-rings. So go ahead and lubricate the starter. It's, it's gonna drop right into the, the cavity right there. You may need to turn the motor over, or jiggle the gear to get it to drop down. There we go, so it dropped down. You got the two eight millimeter fasteners. Keep in mind this rear fastener will, will um, have the ground lug, so you don't necessarily need to tighten it all the way. I'll just put it in partly so I know it's there. There's the ground fastener that goes on when we install the motor, so. Again, just snug it, seven and a half foot pounds. And there you go. All right, so we're gonna assemble the final drive, the final gearbox. Uh, this is your main seal for the output shaft. I'm not gonna replace this. Uh, not too often do they leak, and plus I haven't really messed with a shaft in there. Uh, since I did pull out the, uh, the drive shaft, I'm gonna replace this, um, the seal for the drive shaft. And pretty much this one installs in the same way. It's just a little larger. This is the gear case gasket. There's our seal grab all the hardware and get off the assembly of the final drive. All right, this seal's still in pretty nice shape and not leaking, but I just wanna show how to change a seal since it's in included. You can use a large screwdriver or a, a seal removal pick like this. You know, for a seal that's pretty easy to gain access to, a flat, you know, a flat screwdriver works just as well. So I got the fresh seal, it, you want to install it the same way you pulled the other one out. So it's this outside edge. You're going to go ahead and grease up the lips. And depending on a seal, some seals, you could just use your, your uh, force. And I'm pretty certain I'll be able to just push this in if I wanted to. Um, you could take a large socket that's you know a little larger in diameter or smaller than the outside diameter, but larger than inside diameter, and just tap it in. Or a seal that's flush, it doesn't have a shaft on it. You could just take a mallet and carefully work it around. 
and now it's perfectly flush and that's where you want the seal right there. Pretty self-explanatory how the gearbox goes back together. There's not much going on in there. Go ahead and grease the majority of the shaft because that will protect the seal as it's driven on there. And of course it's perfectly clean as well. So, you know, kind of carefully work it in there. You don't want to roll the lip of a seal. That's that little springs thing. If you ever looked at the seals up closely, you'd see the little spring. And if you damage that, you know, it would cause some issues. So, and one thing with uh, the gearbox is, you know, I cleaned all these surfaces. They're all free of oil. There's still a bit of gear oil in there. So I cleaned the engine without the, um, without the gear case apart. I'm gonna leave this gear alone since I don't wanna change the seal. This little tube, if you did get oil down it, you might wanna blow it out so it's not leaking oil. Uh, that little thing, the little, whatever you wanna call it, grommet, I guess, something like that. I'm gonna put a small amount of silicone to, um, to seal that in place. So you can see I use silicone all the time. The caps never really work. It's just best to put a nail or a screw in there and then you get a little pinhole for a very small amount. And just wipe it in there. Oops, what am I doing? I'm having a little brain fart there. Goes into the cover, so. And this is a, a metal uh, gasket. It's kind of got this rubbery foam stuff on it. Technically, you could reuse these if, if in a pinch. You know, they're kind of most durable of the gaskets. Go ahead and set the gasket on there. And if it doesn't want to hold in place, you can always put a, a small amount of silicone to hold it in place. So I got the hose and I'm holding this and engaging the gears as I'm um, starting to assemble it. So make sure the gasket doesn't drop like it just did right there. You know, now give up and go back to game, game plan one, which was hold it with some silicone. And this is all I'm using the silicone for is to hold the gasket in place. I'm putting it right where the dowels. These dowels don't easily remove on the gearbox. And try number two. I'm kind of eyeing everything. I want to get the gears to mesh and not knock the motor over. Tip the motor up a little bit. There we go. Turn it over and you can see the gear, the, the gasket stayed in place. So no issues there. And I'll start with the funky fastener, the little bit shorter fastener. It goes in this hole right here. All the other ones are the same, I think 45 millimeter long screws. It's just that one up there is a little bit uh, shorter. So. Much like uh, putting together the other cases, you want to just um, use like a T-handle, kind of speed all the, um, the bolts in place. Just close up the gasket. Hopefully I'm not in the way of the camera too much here. And all these torque to about 16 foot pounds, which is like 25 newton meters, something like that. 20 newton meters, I don't remember. Sorry, I'm in America. We use all these like weird measurements here. All right, small amount of gearbox oil dripped out. No big deal there. And another option is I can put the motor back onto the, the wood. I can tell the motor's getting a little heavier now. It's got more steel parts in it. 
doesn't want to sit quite as well with the um, with the shaft sticking out there. I could shim it with a little bit more wood. A couple other things to check. You want to make sure this your gear gearbox oil drain is uh, tight. Um, be setting the torque wrench while I'm doing this here. And this O-ring on the dipstick is also replaceable and found in the gear or in the complete gasket kit. Uh, not really an issue. If you had a high miles motor, it would be a good idea to change it out. Again, just kind of alternate between the fasteners. I can see what I'm doing. There we go. And the last of two. All right, so the gearbox is back together there. Make sure the shaft turns nice. I mean, you'll hear a little whirling because the input shaft isn't supported by the bearing in the belt cover. That's why it makes a funky little noise. It also, I've had people call and say, why is there a free play? I mean, you'll see that shaft. Well, you don't really see it because it's on the other side of the camera, but it moves in and out until the, um, the, the belt cover is reinstalled on the scooter, so. All right, so I grabbed all the parts to the left hand oil, you know, oil sump, the oil pan, the oil pump. I have all the timing components and there's a very small O-ring that I'll show that's very critical that goes on the crankshaft. If you have a major oil leak, if you don't install it, there's the oil pump gasket. And then there's also the gasket, that's the shape of the oil pan that I'll be putting on. And I just decided to put the O-ring on. Since I talked about it, it's in the gasket kit, just change it out. So you can see, kind of just not the easiest job with the gloves, but there's a fresh O-ring on the oil fill. Keep in mind when you kind of put that together, I only barely thread that in because I need to fill the gearbox oil upon assembly of the engine. So. Uh, there's different length timing chains. I think they're like 92, 94, 96 links or 98 links. I don't remember what the exact variations, but uh, GT200 uses a different size than the 300 and 250 motor. There's basically, I think there's three different timing length for the 150 motors all the way up. And so make sure you got the right timing chain. I'll tell you these, uh, I think it's called a Hivo chain or uh, I don't know, there's some other names for it. I don't really care that much about the names, but these, these, this style timing chain that rides on like a sprocket like this, they last quite a long time. I've seen people order them when I walk by the mail order department. I'm like, I don't know why they order it. I've taken apart a motor with like 75,000 miles and the, the chain was still within spec. Uh, go ahead and drop the timing gear on. You can see there's a little peg that's very critical. So it drops right onto that peg and I'll just pull the timing chain around the sprocket there. You're going to take the uh, timing guide, the one that has the large hole in it. Of all the screws, I think it's like 25 millimeter or something. It's a shorter screw that holds the, um, and this little dowel. So the little dowel drops in and then the screw drops on. Get an eight millimeter socket and go ahead and tighten this down. Again, something that's not a cover where I need to have equal torque. Just give it a good snug and there you go. So that's the timing chain. This little foil plate drops on next. We're gonna put the oil pump in. Again, I got a brand new oil pump. The gasket is what I found is you can install it either way. It doesn't really matter, but the oil pump, it's critical that it um, is installed in the correct 
orientation. You can see there's a little tab that just drops right in there. I'm going to take the brand new oil pump. There's a, one critical step you want to do to it before you put it to get put it in. So take the new oil pump. Again, it's just not worth my effort and the risk with the old pump. So you can see in there, there's like these trilobular pumps. That's your inlet. That's your uh, exit. And I just want to fill the inlet hole with oil and turn that thing clockwise. See how it pumps out the other oil hole. And that's just enough to give it a little bit of a, um, a oil charge, so it will um, the pump won't capivate when it first starts up. And this oil pump only drops in one direction. I can't even see, I got the camera in the way. I think I dropped it in the correct direction. You use these long five millimeter screws. And make sure they both drop in. If, if they don't line up, then you need to flip the pump 180. So it lines up just fine. These are five millimeter screws. You don't want to tighten them all that tight. And also, there's a possibility if you over tighten an oil pump, it could bind up the oil pump itself. So just snug. It's a five millimeter fasteners or something like, um, I don't know, like eight foot pounds, something like that. So I just kind of made sure that the oil pump turns over. It turns just fine. Next, I got this little small O-ring. I'm going to put a little bit of grease on it and some grease on the um, shaft down here. Just I don't want to tear this O-ring. You could put a bag uh, down these splines, but I've never found that the splines really damage the O-ring. But pack the O-ring with some grease. Next, I'm going to drop the gear down. This is your timing gear. Again, a small amount of grease, just so the, that little edge won't cut the O-ring as it drops on it. And you'll kind of feel the O-ring it slipped right over it, had a little resistance, just slipped right over it, and that was the correct feel. If it slips over it and you feel it binding the whole way down, it probably cut the O-ring, and it's dragging the O-ring down with the, um, with the gear itself. One thing about these oil pump gears is they spin freely on the crank when the variator is not bolted down. So you can't, even though it is, you, you could start the motor without the, um, the variator installed, the big problem is this, this gear is likely to uh, want to just freewheel on the, um, on the crankshaft. And it doing that is uh, you're not going to be turning your uh, oil pump over. See this oil pump's got a little D-shaped hole on it. They put these little holes so you can um, kind of line it up. And it's kind of like doing surgery. You're working this little hole right here. but is what I'll do is I'll get the chain connected. I'm gonna find the flat. Again, it's more like over there. So once you find the flat on, the, um, on that D shape of the oil pump, just drop it right on there. You got two things that hold the oil pump. This is a Belleville washer. It's got like a dome shape. So the pyramid shaped dome faces up and you drop the screw. It's a six millimeter fastener. Uh, it's marked 10.9, so it's a higher grade fastener. And it's um, a, got the 10 millimeter head instead of an eight millimeter head found on some of the other ones. Sometimes I've, this is one fastener that's kind of difficult to, to get a good torque on. You can um, put a small amount of uh, Loctite on it. You can even get the Loctite going. Real small, you don't need much. But I don't know. I've just had a tendency to do this. I have, uh, I've had two, two motors where I had something drop down. There's a part of the decompression mechanism dropped down the cam channel and broke the uh, oil pump drivetrain, starved the engine oil, killed the crankshaft. And I have one time seen one of these fasteners a little bit uh, spun loose. It didn't, didn't seem to affect anything, but I don't know. It doesn't seem like a good idea. So here's the thing. You turn this over. It, um, it wants the, the bind, you know, turn the pump over. So what you could do is jam like kind of a long needle nose or something and there's those casting ribs on the oil pump. Uh, if you want to torque that with a torque wrench, around seven and a half foot pounds, but that's pretty much it for that little guy there. 
This little oil deflector drops in, keeps, uh, keeps the oil off the oil pump sprocket because this, this is full of oil, maybe halfway up. And if that uh, oil pump tray is full of oil, it drags the motor down. So it's having this little thing, you know, it's not a perfect oil tight seal, but it keeps the, um, keeps a minimal amount of oil from dragging down on the oil pump. And I'm being very careful with these fasteners. I want to drop them down into the bottom of the engine. Those are two small five millimeter fasteners. Again, don't tighten them too tight. Next, we got the oil pump relief here, or the oil pressure relief. And I don't put grease on this because it's lubricated by oil, but you gotta make sure this cavity is perfectly uh, clean. So if, if that uh, piston binds up, you're gonna end up with incorrect or low oil pressure. You know, it could, it could end up holding open. So I'll kind of give it a good feel up and down. It feels very smooth going in and out of the bore. So here's the dreaded timing seal that's found on these uh, engines. The nice thing about them is they're very reliable. I rarely ever see them leaking or have problems, but the undesirable fact is they're not very uh, home serviceable or even by a shop that doesn't have the, the correct tools. Uh, essentially the seal, you can see it's got an integrated uh, guide for this oil pump drive chain and that's what those rubber surfaces silence the uh, oil pump drive chain train. You got the seal lip that's very fragile and you can see there's a spring and the problem is if you push this uh, seal lip right up against this sharp edge it will want to roll this lip and pop the spring off and you'll end up with a major oil leak here. Um, this A28875 seal you know it's pretty much the factory tool will key it. And you can kind of see, I'm just going to drop it on there just temporarily. If you're going to try to install this by hand, you want to line this, these, uh, these two parallel lines with that, the kind of tunnel that leads to the oil pump drive. And the only way you're going to prevent that seal lip from folding is to wrap this section above this uh, oil pump drive sprocket with electrical tape to build it up. So the seal lip has something to ride over this metal edge without snagging. So that's the only way you're gonna really get this on successfully without the factory tool. And you're gonna spend a lot of time um, you know, with the seal all greased up, carefully tapping it all the way around only on this edge to get it squarely installed. You know, it would be right about there. Like I said, it is possible. It's not something I ever do because I do have the factory tool. And I'm gonna show how the factory tool uh, works to install this thing, this seal here. So the factory tool's got a couple parts. Um, I briefly showed it in use for removal of the seal because it's a dual purpose um, tool. This is the seal protector that protects the lip. So that drops on there. We're gonna go ahead and lubricate that. And you could be pretty uh, generous with the grease if you want. Not gonna hurt anything. You have this tool here, and the last time I used it was to remove a seal. So it's got the fine threads that pushes on the end of the crankshaft and pulls the seal out. Wow. All right, so that's the edge that would push on the crank and pull the seal out. Uh, the side that we're gonna use is this side that's gonna um, pull on the threads of this crank and um, pretty much pull the seal down. So I got those two nuts in there. There's two threaded um, uh, bosses that are on these seals. And if you watched my video for disassembly, I was kind of struggling to uh, line them up for a second there. And all you gotta do is hand tighten those two things and that's just the key to the seal. I can go ahead and lubricate this whole entire lip of the seal. And same with the lip of the, um, there. I'm gonna drop it on part way. So it's just sitting there. There's this little nub that you use for the 250 and 300 motors. On the 150 motors, it's, it doesn't use that little thing. So 
I almost got it pretty close just by dropping it on. But you can see it's got like a, a D shape and that, that kind of keys this whole tool. So it's um, set up for, you know, putting the, the seal in at the correct orientation. So I'm gonna thread this onto the end of the crankshaft. You're gonna need two wrenches for this. You're gonna have to hold this upper shaft and start tightening this lower one here, or this lower nut. And so what it's doing is it's pulling on the crankshaft and pushing the large tool down to put the uh, seal in perfectly square. So I feel about the same amount of resistance all the way going down. This tool does the job in like a few minutes and that's it, if that. So I loosened it. I pretty much just felt the tool right when it just starts to have resistance. That means the uh, seal's all the way down in. So unthread this. Unthread the two screws. Take this little guy all out. And voila, we could double check our work, wipe all the excess grease off, and the lip of the seal is flush with this casting all the way around. And I pulled the seal tool, I don't see any folds of the lip. And the last part is we're gonna pop the oil pan on. Uh, the spring, very, very important. I already had the piston in there, no big deal. There's gonna be three dowels dowel, dowel, and dowel that doesn't do much. And I got the gasket that I misplaced. And this gasket, it's, it's got like a silicon um, rubber on it. See that little peg, it lines up with the spring. So you can kind of feel your way around. Get the oil pan lined up over the pet, the, uh, the dowels. I'll put maybe one or two screws in. You know, I have the resistance of the spring, so I'll start with this screw. It's the easiest one to install here. And you have two um, two clips for your um, your brake hose, or if you have a model with drum brakes, it would be um, your brake uh, cable. There we go. And if you want to come back with a torque wrench, could seven and a half foot pounds, just like pretty much every other six millimeter fastener. But my hand's kind of like a torque wrench. It makes it click. It's actually my wrist clicking. No, <laughs> but yeah, just evenly snug them back and forth. You know, so you can see I'm not putting a ton of leverage, I'm just using my wrist. That's enough to torque it adequately. Uh, last thing that I like to do, because sometimes as the belt wears, it will make contact to this gasket, is what happens is we'll start pulling filaments of the gasket out and break the gasket down. It's kind of unbelievable, but that's what it does. So I'll scrape the gasket from the top surface up here. And that, that just prevents the belt from tearing it up. So it's just flush with the metal. So flip it back over. Every time, pick up the motor, it's a little heavier. And be careful with this cam chain here. It's still engaged, but you can turn the motor over, kind of just make sure everything's turning good. So for part two, I pretty much have most of the uh, bottom end assembled. The transmission, you can watch my transmission videos um, on how to assemble that. I'm gonna leave that off. A lot of times I like putting the, uh, the belt drive all back in when the motor's back in the scooter. So a lot of times I won't even bother with everything on this side until I get the, the engine back in the scooter. Uh, I'll probably put the dipstick in there just to keep any debris out. Again, you can replace that O-ring if you like, it's included with the kit. Um, 
on your, your right side. I'm not going to bother putting the water pump cover on until I get the top end installed. The reason being is I like having access to the crank to turn it over to get the motor at top dead center. So you can easily find uh, the timing marks, you know, with the motor open and it's just easier to turn over. So, all right, so that pretty much concludes part two of the complete engine overhaul on the GTS Vespa 300 motor. Uh, look forward to posting part three, which is the top end, and we'll slap this motor back in the scooter and see how it goes. See you guys next time. Robot here, Vespa Motorsport here in San Diego, ScooterWest.com, number one supplier here in North America for all, all things Vespa. All these parts that we're, I've gone over, it's all stuff we have in stock. There's no other dealer here in the States that stocks as much as we do.